In this video, I will write an explicit formula to compute Taylor polynomials quickly. I had already defined Taylor polynomials in the previous two videos. I explained the properties they satisfy and why we care about them, but I am still missing a quick formula. Let's recall what we know so far. The nth Taylor polynomial for the function f at the real number a is a polynomial, which is a good approximation for f near a. This means that as x approaches a, the difference between f and the polynomial approaches 0, faster than the nth power of x minus a. In a previous video, I explained why this limit being 0 means that the polynomial is a good approximation for f. Or, equivalently, f and the polynomial have the same value at a, the same first derivative at a, the same second derivative at a, etc., all the way to the same nth derivative at a. As we know, these two properties are equivalent. The first property explains why Taylor polynomials are useful. The second property is simpler to understand and use. My goal now is to simplify the definition even further and get an explicit formula for the Taylor polynomials. For simplicity, let's begin with the case when a equals 0. This is what a generic polynomial with degree at most n looks like. I can choose its coefficients. To this polynomial, I will impose some conditions. I want the value at 0 to be f of 0, the derivative at 0 to be f prime of 0, the second derivative at 0 to be the second derivative of f at 0, and so on, all the way to the nth derivative at 0. At this moment, I invite you to pause the video and try to do the calculation. Each one of these conditions will tell us the value of one of the coefficients. This is not a difficult calculation. It is nice to do it once by yourself at your own pace. So pause the video and do it. When you are ready, keep watching and I will give you the answer. Did you do it? The answer is that the kth derivative of the polynomial at zero is k factorial times c sub k. Only the term of degree k contributes. The kth derivative of the polynomial is a bit more complicated, but the kth derivative of the polynomial evaluated at zero is just this term only. I want to make this equal to the kth derivative of f at 0. That means that c sub k is the kth derivative of f at 0 over k factorial. Great, I get a formula for the Taylor polynomial. Now, this was the case for a equals 0. What about for other values of a? There is a trick to make the calculation simpler. Instead of writing a generic polynomial like this, in terms of powers of x, I can write it like this, in terms of powers of x minus a. It is still a generic polynomial. If you think in terms of linear algebra, this is a change of basis. The advantage of this form is that now the value of the kth derivative at a will depend only on the coefficient of x minus a to the k. I invite you again to pause the video, take as much time as you need, impose the conditions and find out the value of the coefficients. I'm skipping the calculations. To clarify, I'm not claiming this is obvious. Take the time you need to convince yourself of the result. If you impose the same conditions as before, but at a rather than at zero, you will get this formula for the Taylor polynomial. I found what I was looking for, an explicit formula. I am going to call this the third definition of Taylor polynomials. Given a CN function, f at a point a, the nth Taylor polynomial for f at a is this polynomial. That's it. Some calculus textbooks prefer to use this formula as a starting point. It is equivalent to the other two definitions I had given earlier. It is simpler and it is quite nice for calculations. Personally, I think this formula hides where Taylor polynomials come from and why they are good approximations for a function. That is why I chose to begin with the first definition, the more abstract one, and I slowly derive this formula from it. In the end, 
it is better to understand all three equivalent ways of thinking about Taylor polynomials. Note that this polynomial, by construction, has degree at most n. The terms up to degree n were enough to make sure the polynomial and the function had the same first n derivatives. We could add terms of higher order, they could not change anything, but they are unnecessary. In a way, the polynomial with degree at most n is the simplest one we can construct with the desired properties. Notice also that by insisting the degree be at most n, we have made the Taylor polynomials of a function at a point unique. With the previous two definitions, this was not clear. A priori, it looked possible that two different polynomials might have satisfied the definitions, but now we know they are unique because we have an explicit formula. As an example, consider the function with this graph. I'm going to look at the Taylor polynomials at zero. The first polynomial gives us a tangent line, as we know. It is a good approximation near zero. This is the graph of the second Taylor polynomial. It is an even better approximation. And this is the third. Let's jump ahead to the sixth. This one is a fantastic approximation, not just at zero, but on a pretty large interval around zero. This gives me an idea. The higher the order, the better the approximation. What if I use a polynomial of infinite degree? That should be an excellent approximation for the function, shouldn't it? But a polynomial of infinite degree is not a polynomial. It is a power series. We are going to refer to the Taylor polynomial of infinite degree as the Taylor series of the function. Here is the definition. Given a C-infinity function f at a point a, the Taylor series for f at a is the power series, center at a, given by this formula. It is the same formula I had before, but instead of stopping at degree n, I keep adding terms of all degrees. This formula basically means that all the derivatives of the power series at a are the same as the derivatives of f at a. Notice that a Taylor series, like all power series, only makes sense wherever it is convergent, in its interval of convergence. I constructed this power series thinking that it could be a great approximation for f near a. In the ideal case, it could not merely be an approximation, it could be exact. The function could be equal to its Taylor series. We call such functions analytic. Let's be careful. Analytic is the ideal case. It does not always happen. Even when the Taylor series is convergent, it's not necessarily equal to the function. Not every C-infinity function is analytic. But spoiler, most of the common functions are analytic. For completeness, I will add a piece of notation. We have a special name for the Taylor series at zero. We call it the Maclaurin series. This is just a name, nothing more. Okay, so far this has been a very theoretical sequence of videos. We need some examples. In the next video, I will compute a few Maclaurin series for common functions. After that, I will explain how we can prove that the function is analytic. We still have quite some work to do, but there is a lot of nice payoff at the end in terms of applications. Stay tuned.